I was sitting there this morning thinking how soothing great music can be. And I thought of the scene where Saul, the king, having such struggles with so many things, asked that David remain right there with him. And David's music brought comfort to Saul's soul. We hope the music of this day will bring comfort for you as well, and we certainly want that to be true as we look forward to our concert next Sunday. The music department has chosen the theme, Clinging to Hope, and that will be the, the, uh, the thought that will be threaded through the music next Sunday morning. In both services, they will be identical. They will be duplicate concerts, and you will enjoy that so much. If you're a guest of ours today, please know that you're invited back. We'd love to have you, and it's a good time for me to welcome all of you who are visiting today. Let me include you who are online. Thank you for joining us here at Stonebriar Community Church in Frisco. Always a pleasure to have you. Today, Don will say more about it. We'll observe the Lord's table. And as is always true, following this observation and the service of worship, we receive a special offering. We call it our Benevolence Fund. It's used only specifically for needs that occur uh, among those who come and seek help from our church. Uh, big announcements aren't made and people's names aren't mentioned, 
But believe me, uh, needs are met. Sometimes it's right down to uh, food for the table or clothing for those in the family. So thank you today for being generous as you leave. The departing offering will be strictly for that. Now, for a moment, let's uh, clock back in on this, on this uh, concert I mentioned earlier, and you'll watch the screens for a little of the touch of the music. It goes by quickly, no words, so watch closely and enjoy this soothing, encouraging music. For over 2,000 years, the body of Christ has been gathering on a regular basis. Sometimes the gathering is two or three people. Sometimes there are hundreds there. Sometimes there are thousands there. We gather according to his instructions to observe the Lord's Supper, what we call communion. We will do so today. The main reason we do it, according to the Lord, is to remember him. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And we, uh, let me encourage you today to remember his whole life, his birth, uh, his early years, three years of his earthly ministry, and of course his suffering and his death and his resurrection. But let's remember Christ today. Our first hymn is a grand one. It's hymn number 309, if you'd like to use your hymnal. Otherwise, the words will be up on the screen. It's entitled, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Let's do just that. Would you please stand?
Paul writing the Corinthian believers in the first century, the Apostle Paul took time to go back and remember that occasion when Jesus had his last meal with his disciples. He prepared the Corinthians for observing the Lord's table in light of the carnality in that church by reminding them that they must have clean hearts in order to come to the table and take of the bread and, and, of, the, and of the juice as well. He wrote, you re I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat this and do it in remembrance of me. As Don mentioned, down through the centuries, the church has set aside time in worship to go back and remember those elements, simple elements, small piece of pastry to remind us of the Savior's body and a small cup of juice, to remind us of his blood. But what magnificent reminders they are as we realize he gave his body on our behalf. In fact, before crucified, it was bruised beyond recognition. And then he gave his blood to cleanse us from our sins. Today, we want you to be served the bread and to spend time searching your hearts, making sure first that you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, and second, that you're walking in the light, even as he is in the light. If those two things are true, this table is for you, regardless of your church affiliation or lack of such. And please, when you serve these elements, retain them, hold them until we all are served, and then I will lead us as we partake together. Bow with me, will you? Make this time especially meaningful, our Father, as we remember the price paid on our behalf. Thank you for Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. As we hold this piece of pastry in our hands, take us back to that time when our Savior gave himself for us. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We will praise you forever, Father, for providing him as the sacrifice for sin. Sin that we deserve the punishment for, he bore on our behalf in his own body on the tree. Make this time meaningful for all of us, I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
at that last meal the disciples had with the Savior, they had no idea what was ahead of them. As Jesus snapped off a piece of that brittle loaf, he told them to take and to eat from that piece of pastry and, and to remember him. For this would be the last time they would eat this meal together until they ate it in the kingdom. We anticipate that marvelous day when we will all gather with the Savior and we will be with his saints and we will again remember the body given for us. We take this bread in remembrance of Christ. After the same manner, Jesus also took the cup and he said to them, this cup represents my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you keep on declaring my death until I return. Again, retain the cup, hold it, so that we might all partake together.
How good of the Lord to leave us with symbols that remind us of that timeless truth that the blood of Christ washes away our sins. Each time we drink from the cup, we remember that marvelous eternal detergent that cleanses us inside out. We drink this now in remembrance of our Savior's blood. Thank you, dear Father, for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for looking ahead and realizing that in generations to come, there would be those who would follow your son and would need a reminder lest they forget the price that was paid. We've held the, the bread in our hands. We've drunk from the cup. We've reminded ourselves that the Lord is good. Mercy is everlasting. Thank you for the Savior's death on our behalf. We worship him as we would worship none other, even Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. The choir's anthem this morning is based on some scripture from Matthew 11. These are one of the, it's one of the most treasured promises that Jesus ever spoke to his disciples and by extension to us as well. About halfway through the anthem, I'll turn and, and invite you to sing with us uh, the main melody. If you have one of these bulletins this morning, the, the music and words are printed on the back, but also the words will be up on the screen. In Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thy head 
there are times when it is good simply to hear the word of God read to us rather than finding it in our Bibles and reading along. Occasionally we can hear things that we would miss while trying to locate the lines of a verse or the page on which it's found. Today, let's do that. Let me read for you Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 25. You simply stand and listen to the reading, and then please remain standing for prayer. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Dear Father, we long to carry out what you have declared here in this passage. We long to allow the Spirit of God now that he has taken residence within us, to reveal love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and as we will hear today, self-control. We don't live in a world where these things are regularly seen, even among those people considered significant others. Often, truth be told, even, even in our own homes. But we long for them to be true. We long for our souls to be so healthy so well that these qualities flow out of our lives so that they encourage others, touch them where they hurt, strengthen them where they are weak, and minister to them when they feel the weight of life pressing upon them. Help us, our Father, to live in such a way that we, in fact, represent Christ to others. Then it will truly be well with our souls. We long for that. We pray for that. How good you are to provide for us and our needs. Thank you for meeting our needs. Not only as individuals, but as a body of people at this church. Through almost 25 years, you've never failed to meet our needs. How encouraging that is to us. Thank you. We give today because we love 
to participate in what is involved in supporting a ministry, being here for others, sending our gifts to those we'll never meet, that their needs might be met. We pray that the health of our souls will be revealed in the motive behind our giving. We give because we have first been given to by you, Lord. Thank you for doing that. Bless these gifts and remind us, Father, that your grace is always abundant. Your mercies are new every morning. We worship you, filled with gratitude. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Well, I've decided to preach a sermon you won't soon forget. <laughs> to begin with, it's going to be short. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd get a little applause out of that. Reminds me of my friend, the late Dr. Clyde Cook, when he was president of Biola University. As I recall, he invited the president of the Navigators, Lawrence Sani, to come and bring the commencement speech. Sani, also a graduate of that school, understood the life and the student world of Biola and decided he would do something a little different. And did he ever? Dr. Cook told me he stood up and began his commencement speech with, you have spent four years studying about the Christian life. Well, get out there and do it. And he sat down. I think you got a standing ovation as a result of that. Well, I won't be that short, but I will be brief, and I won't get into the weeds as I talk about something that is a constant concern to all of us, and it doesn't require a lot of words to describe that. But I am going to offer a simple outline to begin with, because they are the ones that we all remember longer than the others. I'm talking on self-control. You've set through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and you probably don't remember most of them. I understand that. I have a hard time remembering some of those things. But today on self-control, you've got to remember this. This isn't a, a, a nice little anchor in the relay that we finish up the list with. This is... This is the victory side of living for Christ. The Bible offers three major categories when it comes to self-control. Here's the outline. We are to apply self-control in our morals. Second, we are to apply, apply self-control in our motives, and we're to apply self-control in our mouth. Morals, motives, and mouth. All three are vital. So let me cut to the chase. When we apply self-control to our morals, we're talking about handling temptation. Temptation in whatever realm. We usually think first of lust, and we should. It's a battleground for everyone. But it certainly would include other areas as well morally, we must train ourselves as people of self-control. We must train ourselves to say no. Ideally, to say never. And you won't fail and you won't fall. You won't live with a backlog of regret, you will pass the test morally, and there are few who do. You can and you will. Our model for this would be Joseph, Genesis chapter 39. No need to turn, you know the story like you know the back of your hand. 
Joseph had come through all kinds of challenges in life until he was finally promoted to be in charge of the home and the affairs of a man named Potiphar. While engaged in that well-deserved promotion, Potiphar's wife began to make the moves on Joseph. You'll read all about it in the 39th of Genesis. She didn't hold back. She tried everywhere in the world to seduce him into her bed. Joseph not only said no, he said never. I've come into this position by the grace of God and I will never forget that my life is lived as an open book before my God and therefore I cannot do such an evil thing. I cannot touch you. He didn't flirt with her. He didn't linger with her. He didn't play around in the bedroom where she was. He said no and never. He also knew that Potiphar trusted him. The story continues and it turned against him. And as a result, he was, he was unfairly accused and wound up in an Egyptian prison. But he had not failed morally because he said no and because he said never. That may sound dated, that may sound obsolete, I do not care. When you say no, you will not fall. When you say never, you will be morally pure. To quote Warren Sanny with the Navs, go out there and do that. Don't play around in your computer with the internet. There's enough there to sink any life. Stay out of that area. Get tough on yourself. It's called self-control. Don't go there morally. So that's the first. Self-control applied morally will lead you into a life of purity. And you'll be grateful the rest of your days. So will your family. If you pastor a church, so will your congregation. If you lead a company, so will the people who serve you. Applying self-control to your motives relates to how you handle the spiritual disciplines in public. Now stay with me here. The model here is Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount addresses this because he's surrounded by, as all the others of that day were, Pharisees who did everything they knew to do to be seen by and admired by others, even though they were phony to the core. Their motives were impure. And so Jesus is, is I think it's, it's the key verse in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 8, do not be like them. Apply self-control to your motives. You are living your life before an audience of one, one, your maker, your creator, your God, your savior. He sees everything. He knows everything about you. He not only knows what you do, he knows why you do it, and that's motive. Knowing that that's true, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, touches on three very well-known areas in the Christian life, in the disciplines of the Christian life. The first is giving. 
when you give, don't blow your horn. Don't call attention to your gift. Don't thump the plate, make it look like it's a big offering. Don't uh, look around to make sure people see the size of the check. Don't go there. Say no to that. You do your best giving anonymously. You want to really give, give to needs, don't tell anybody about it. That's a pure motive. Self-control will help you tap the brakes when you're tempted to wave your check or display your wealth or look for a name on a building that's going to be named after you because of your gift. Don't go there. If they want to put your name on a building, that's up to them. That's not why you give. Your motive is to give for the glory of God, period. So that's giving. The second is in verse 7. When you pray, when you pray, no big words, no display of great theological acumen, no, again, no showing off. That's what hypocrites do. They pray so that people will be impressed. God isn't. Christ despised hypocrisy probably more than any other of the sins. Hypocrisy stinks. Let me just say it straight. There's nothing fun about hypocrisy before God. And it goes on all the time among Christians. When you pray, get in your closet. You've got a long prayer coming. I don't need to sit through it. And when you pray, you're not praying to the one sitting next to you. You're not trying to sell your car to the guy across the room. Your prayer goes to God. Remember, audience of one, one. He knows why you're praying, that's motive. He understands your need. He knows the sincerity of your heart. Go there. So when you give, when you pray, when you fast, Uh, he warns us in verse 16 and following not to look disheveled because you've been fasting. Uh, uh, again, that's hypocrisy. If you choose to fast, fast. If you want to pass up a meal for the glory of God, so that you can give full attention to him, do it. Just don't tell me about it. Don't brag about it. It's a matter of motive. I love the way Eugene Peterson renders this passage in Matthew chapter 6. Listen to his words. I really want you to hear them. When you practice some appetite-denying Discipline, that's fasting. When you practice that to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go to the Training, if you go into training inwardly, act normal outwardly. That's probably the best statement I've ever read when it comes to motives. If you're going to go into training inwardly, that's the discipline, just live a normal life. I love the story of the three, uh, of, of the little kids that had a club. They put the club together, and because it was a club, they decided to have, have, have rules. They decide to keep it pretty simple. Nobody act big. Nobody act little. Everybody act medium. That's pretty good guideline. When it comes to fasting, don't try to impress me. 
or others with how tough it's been because you've given up food while you've gotten alone with God. Uh, you're not answering to anybody else. Audience of one. Peterson goes on. Shampoo and uh, comb your hair. Brush your teeth. That's not a bad idea right there. Wash your face. God doesn't require attention-getting devices. He won't overlook what you are doing. He will reward you for your actions. Um... This is a good time for me to address Christians in bad breath, but I'm going to pass it up. I'm going to leave it. <laughs> You're not more spiritual because you don't brush your teeth. I'll add one more thought here. When you live your life before an audience of one, you will care less and less about what other people think. It's true. You will live before the Lord Jesus, you will please him, and you will not spend your time worrying about, wonder what they thought of what I said. Wonder what they thought about me in this. Wonder what they feel about, so give it up. Your audience is never the public. It's an audience of one. The one who saves you, the one who is using you, Live your life before him. When you do, you will soar. When you don't, you'll stink. So, let's agree to soar. I'm addressing self-control in these areas of our lives, our morals, how we handle temptation, our motives, how we express the disciplines of the Christian life, when we are in public, and now I come to the most difficult of the three, our mouths, our tongues. This is a tough one. You know it, I know it. It's time to address it again. Our tongues make liars and killers out of all of us if they're not controlled. Mm. It isn't wicked. God blesses us through the use of a tongue that's been led by the Spirit of God. Every message you've ever heard that's ministered to you, you have the tongue to thank for it getting communicated. So it isn't a wicked organ in the body. It's just a body that easily gets out of control. However, it's sneaky because it's little and, and it hides behind the ivory palaces. In, in your mouth, this slab of muscle, this membrane in your mouth, it gives the impression that it's pretty neutral and it's not a problem. Just speak freely. Oh, don't go there. The one we have to thank for this, we have Joseph to thank for the morals. We have Jesus to thank for the motives. James chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. If you're starting to begin a scripture memory program, don't leave out James 3, 1 to 10. Don't leave that out. Even better, practice it. It says it all. Virtually says it all. It's small, but it's powerful. James even uses three very helpful illustrations to to uh, clarify that. We use just two straps of leather and we control a powerful 
horse, once it's broken, it's called a bridle. On, on a large ship, you look at the size of the rudder compared to the ship, it's relatively small. It controls the direction of the ship. And how about a, a forest fire where hundreds of thousands of, of acres are burned because of a tiny spark? One cigarette flicked over into the brush, one match that isn't put out, and the fire goes wild. What the bridle is to the horse, what the rudder is to the ship, what that spark is to the forest fire, the tongue is in life. By the way, just no extra charge for this, just a tip. Uh, if you find yourself beginning a sentence with, I shouldn't say this, don't. <laughs> that, that's, your, that's your conscience saying, whoop, tap the brakes. Don't do that. Don't say that. One of my mentors had a wonderful statement he used to make. I've never felt sorry for the things I did not say. That's controlling your tongue. The tongue is actually neutral when you stop to think about it. Our problem is the heart. You see, the tongue is a bucket that goes down deep into the well of our hearts and out comes what has been in the heart. If your heart is cold, your tongue will be uncaring. If, if your heart is nasty, your tongue will be vulgar. If, if your heart lacks integrity, your tongue will be deceptive. If your heart is harsh, your tongue will be abusive. I'll tell you, I have witnessed some awfully abusive things among believers. And sometimes it's just taken my breath away. How can he say that? James puts it right. Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. Brothers and sisters, this is not right. That's James. This is not right. With the same tongue, we bless our God as we've done through this morning worship service. The Lord's table, the songs, we, we've sung the, 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 the prayers that have been offered, the, the words of scripture, all of them coming as blessings to God's people. And if you're not careful, I'll tell you before sundown, you're a serial killer with your tongue. Attacking her, attacking him, saying ugly things about this person or that person. Lack of self-control. There you have it. Here's my message. Which brings me to the ultimate question, how's your heart? How's your heart? Solomon wrote, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Proverbs 4.23. In the New Living Translation, it reads, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. 
course it does. A lustful heart, you'll fall morally. It's only a matter of time. Lust will win every time. If you don't tap the brakes, don't tell me you can't. It's a matter of won't. You can. You must. Say no. In fact, say never. I will never compromise morally. I will never go there. And you're safe. Motives? Keep check on them. When I was at seminary, my sister heard me speak on motives uh, in a particular message she uh, heard, and, and she was an, had a beautiful penmanship, and, and she made me a small sign that stayed on my desk throughout my four years at the seminary. What's your motive? What's your motive? Why am I studying all this? Why am I taking this course? Why am I training for ministry? Why am I pursuing this career? Why am I writing this paper? Only you know your motives. I, I, I can't always read them. Sometimes others can, but usually you can hide them. And you know down inside you really want the credit. Stop that. Tap the brakes. It's called self-control. And the Spirit of God lives inside with his divine foot right on that brake pedal, ready to apply it. Don't go there. Don't say that. Don't think that. Now I'll tell you, if, if, if your heart is soft and teachable, I'll tell you, Christ is thrilled with your life. He has things he wants to teach you and he wants to show you and wants to use you in, in ways that you, you just wouldn't imagine. But if your heart is hard and resistant, he doesn't write you off. He just waits for an opportunity to invade, to take charge. And you hold the key to that door. That's... It's yours to unlock. The key works on the inside. Open your heart. Tell the Lord this has been out of control long enough. And it's going to stop. As a result, I'll, I'll tell you, 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 will, you will enjoy a peace and a relief that can't be put into words. It may be the ninth of the list of nine in the fruit of the Spirit, but I'll tell you, it, it brings up the rear powerfully. It applies to love and, and joy and, and peace, certainly patience, and we go on through the whole list. That self-control is sort of trumps all the rest of those fruit in the uh, cluster of the spirit that works in you. The great thought, he, as a child of God, he's taken up residence within us to be in charge. When he's in charge, you're beautiful to be with. You're, 
You're attractive in every way, best of all, inside, deep inside. And I'll tell you, people want to be with you because they don't see these qualities in most folks. They don't. That's what drew them to, to Christ. Closing story, and I'm, I'm finished, I promise. I remember saying to Dr. Stan Toussaint, whom I dearly loved to the last day of his life, I said, you know what, Dr. Toussaint? I was studying just this last week about that dinner that Jesus had with the sinners. And he said, yeah. I said, man, I'm impressed. He would open his doors and let them in. I can just picture the Pharisees standing outside the windows going, shaking their heads. How in the world could he rub shoulders with sinners like that? And Stan laughed. And he said, let me tell you another side of that same scene. They wanted to be with him. Isn't that a good line? Why did I not think of that? <laughs> they wanted to be with him. Nobody felt obligated. You don't have to come if you don't want to. But we're, we're putting on a, a meal plan for tomorrow night. You're invited. If you want to come, you're sure welcome. Here set people from the street. Here set tax collectors. Here set those who had failed in their lives. Here set prostitutes. Here set people who had just made a mess of one marriage after another. And on and on and on it went. And that was his group who wanted to be with him. Why? They found in him love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I love it faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And they couldn't stay away. Let me encourage you with that thought. Same will be true for you. You will have no trouble witnessing for Christ if you live with these qualities genuinely at work before an audience of one. You will be in demand. People will want to know how can they spend time with you because they long for those things. Oops. I'm about to turn this into a long sermon. I promised I wouldn't do that. You know Christ? He, you know the Lord Jesus? He's, he's in your life. You don't? Come on. Come on home. We're here for you. We care about you. Truly. We really care for you. We'll never shame you. We'll never rebuke you. We'll never embarrass you. Of course you've not lived a good life. You haven't had any power at work in you. But he'll bring the power and the result will be marvelous. Thank you, dear Father, for helping me be able to say these things today, even though I'm not a model of many of them. I want to be by your grace, I'm able to speak on them without having to be a perfect model of every part of them. But I want to be. I want to please you, and I want my motives to be right. I want my morals to be pure, and I, I want my mouth to be under control. So do most of these people who've been listening. So help us, Lord. May your spirit do extra work in our hearts in Jesus name everybody said
Amen. Before you go, we'd love to know how we can care for you. Visit stonebriar.org slash guest to fill out a guest card where you can introduce yourself, share a prayer request, and find ways you can connect with our church family. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday. Have a great week.